John Muir embodied the spirit of, I love the rock climb and this place should be preserved. Well, you know, that's a perfect person to, to name uh, the valley after. We saw so much beauty in Muir Valley. Even from the beginning, there is this thought that we wanted to preserve Muir Valley for how wild it is. Just so much wildlife down there. The wild flowers and the waterfalls and the snakes and reptiles, and we're always seeing something new. You come out to Muir, you're coming to a place where everything is well maintained and you see uh, a lot of nature down there. So it's just a beautiful place. We were more originally were thinking of this as a nature preserve in which we could allow rock climbing. A lot of thought went into the bolting, encouraging people to use stick clips, putting the second bolt so it's not so high, and the name tags on the route so you're not accidentally getting on the wrong route, getting on something harder than you think. That, that was all done to provide people the best opportunity to have a safe, first experience outdoors, and every experience after that, really. It was kind of unusual in the climbing community, but Rick and I felt that a love of nature and wanting to preserve nature and climbing were not mutually exclusive. They weren't contradictory to each other. And so we set up Muir Valley as a combination climbing arena and nature preserve. Nestled in the hollers of eastern Kentucky, the Muir Valley Nature Preserve and Climbing Area has become one of the top climbing destinations in the country with over 400 routes in a scenic forest setting. Well-marked trails, clean facilities, and a friendly climbing community are what visitors to Muir Valley will find today, unaware of how much dedication went into making this extraordinary site. It took the work of many volunteers driven by a vision from a couple of engineers from Indianapolis who by pure luck happened to stumble upon the property in 2003. We saw cliff lines that were things that we'd never dreamed of climbing before, but they just looked like they had so much potential. It was like, holy, <laughs> this is really something. Uh, and we walked up the walls. We only saw about 5% of the valley, if that. And I could tell right away that Rick was just itching to get this property. And we made an agreement that day when we went into the courthouse after we bought the land for Muir Valley, the first thing that the PBA officer asked us is, what the hell do you want with all that rock? <laughs> I felt like saying, you're not a rock climber, are you? <laughs> At the time we established Muir Valley, there was a desperate need for Muir Valley. Pocket Wall had just been closed. Torrent Falls was closing. A couple years before that, the Military Wall Archaeological Dig is where the Forest Service closes some of Military Wall, just a couple of routes. But the symbolic closure of that ends up being something that really ripples throughout the community. Now people stop thinking about developing routes in the, the Daniel Boone National Forest proper. Now they're looking to other areas and Mirror Valley ends up being a great example of that. To the local population, it maybe was just kind of part of the landscape. It was being used as a landfill, it was being used for ATVs. When we got down into the valley, there was logging refuse all over the place. Uh, cables, some steel, uh, cut off end logs and stuff. It was, a, it was a pile of junk. It had been used as an illegal trash dump for generations. Rick and Liz Weber were able to secure a grant through the state of Kentucky to remove the literal tons of garbage from the valley, filling as many as 80 large gravel trucks with refuse. With the trash removed, what remained was over 360 acres of land with dozens of beautiful sandstone walls, but no established climbs. So the Webbers reached out to route developers and asked them to visit the property. When I first met Rick and Liz, they were uh, members at uh, Climb Time Towers, one of the climbing gyms in Indianapolis. So I was setting routes there at the time. They mentioned that they had just purchased some property in Kentucky and asked if, uh, they said, hey, can you do this outside? There was just so much rock, it was so crazy. In the first two years is pretty much the heyday of the bolting. That is when um, the bulk of the routes were bolted in Muir Valley. Started off with a small group of people from Indianapolis that all knew each other and then it kept growing. We'd all meet there and JJ and Jared, this, you know, their enthusiasm was just over the top and then fueled with all this coffee. They're, 
their pupils would be dilated and they'd be like, yeah, yeah, and it'd be like this synergy, you know, you could feel this palpable energy, you know, and I just knew I was going to be in for a full day of it. Well, I think I did the math on all these bolts and they should work and it should be good and I shouldn't break my ankle if I fall, but you know, I might. <laughs> so we were just of the mind of like, we're going to bolt, bolt everything with the intention that like that would take pressure off of some of these other places. And I think one of the reasons I enjoyed putting a lot of the moderate routes is I knew more people would climb them and more people would enjoy them. Plus I wasn't that hard of a climber anyway, so I was more of a 514 bushwhacker. Oh my gosh! Yeah! Good God! <laughs> Yeah, Jaron and Carla were just like addicted, you know, to coming down here in the River Valley and the, the work they put in and the roots they established is just phenomenal. I, I still enjoy climbing their roots. I enjoy, yeah, Carla's roots too. You know, if you ask me who's better, it would be Carla. <laughs> Muir Valley slowly took shape as a direct result of a devoted, small group of volunteers. With routes being developed and more people now coming to the valley, the focus shifted to safety and infrastructure. So in the beginning, there were a lot of people who would contact Rick and Liz to say, hey, we're interested in helping out. We want to volunteer. And they needed somebody to be able to harness all of that potential and that energy and that resource. And that's kind of how Friends of Muir Valley and the Trail Days got started. Every Trail Day, we'd go down and, and somebody build a, a trail that goes somewhere. Friends of Muir Valley was originally a casual volunteer organization on it. They had no officers other than a chairman. It was a bunch of climbers, a bunch of people who want to have fun and who want to give back. And there's 250 acres there, and it was just a lot to do all the time. The erosion that was happening because of the rains and the flash flooding and all this was tearing up the roads terribly. They were never intended for that. These were basically logging roads that were put in years ago. And so we spent hours and weekends just to maintain the roads, to maintain the ability to get a rescue unit down there should the bad thing happen. Muir Valley has uh, a number of initiatives that were put into place. The first one was communications, and we had one member, Paul Shalabarger, who was very instrumental in helping get that set up. I know from a personal standpoint that I have saved people's lives because of that emergency response system. So I'm pretty proud of that. The first bridge we built, we built three feet wide. We had an emergency and we had to walk through the water because we couldn't carry the gurney across the bridge. Hence, the bridges went to five feet. They're all five feet now. We thought if we opened it free to the public, we might get 200 people a year. We could handle that. Then the, the final year that we had it, which was 2014, we had 45,000 people visit Muir Valley. I can't believe the amount of cars I've seen every weekend. Like, I don't know where they're all coming from. <laughs> As more and more climbers visited Muir Valley, the need for a sustainment plan was realized to ensure that the roads, trails, routes, and infrastructure would be maintained. In order to fundraise the estimated $90,000 a year, a pay for parking solution was devised. You know, this was a, a six-figure a year maintenance project and uh, or as my wife and I like to refer to it as this big hole in the ground we throw money into and we weren't going to be there to do it. So if, uh, you know, it's all well and good to have a 501c3, but if they don't have the funds, if they don't have the means by which to generate that money to keep the place going, um, it would just, it would die. It was clear that raising funds to keep Muir Valley solvent and operational after we were dead and not putting money into it was going to be necessary. We looked at the number of cars that we were getting, did the math, and it was pretty obvious that $10 per car would achieve the financial goals that would sustain the board ability to maintain the valley. With a system in place to guarantee income to sustain the valley, in 2015 the Webers gifted Muir Valley to the climbing community, passing ownership to the friends of Muir Valley. Rick and Liz have since stepped back in their role as owners, with the current Friends of Muir Valley board seeking to carry on the example the Webbers initiated. Muir Valley has become a shining example of how climbing and conservation can take place in lockstep. This notion has taken hold, and over the years, climbing and climbers have changed 
Not only has the local community been positively impacted, but individual lives have changed. So we originally did a 2016 economic impact study for the climbing community. We found that climbers spend around $3.8 million per year in the Red River Gorge. This is a, one of the poorest counties, one of the, it's in the bottom 10 based on median family income in the United States out of 3,050 counties. So one of the great things about climbing coming to this area is that it is this really unique shot in the arm of economic development. It's something that's organically happened over time. There's eating establishments and gear stores and all types of things down here. And one of the great things is that you know, we can use Mirror Valley as an early example of climbers doing a great job of being land stewards. They've got sustainable trails. They institute a leave no trace ethic. They're educating climbers. There are great environment for new climbers to come in. Watching my daughter climb the routes that we put in at Mirror Valley, the first time we did it, it, it felt very surreal. I think even when we were first bolting up Mirror Valley, the thought never crossed my mind that someday I would bring my own child to climb this routes. Just um, so many people coming together with a shared goal and a shared passion. I recognized early on that there was no climb that I ever did that somebody else didn't put in the work. Somebody had to make the trail to that climb. Somebody had to bolt that climb. I have old friends from Colorado that climb here and they're like, this is not like a climbing here, this is a nature preserve, you know. Just the friendships that were made and that, that shared adventure. It gave me an outlet to volunteer, to give back. It gave me a direction. So as we see more and more climbers coming to this area, I think it's going to become increasingly important for climbers, particularly climbing preserves like Mirror Valley, to be held up as a role model for showing how we can take care of the land, how we can be good community partners, and how we can make sure that climbing can be a sustainable, low environmental impact sport, which it can be. And Mirror Valley today is what it is because of the Webbers. From the land that no one wanted, the Webbers, along with countless volunteers, were able to transform what was once a dumping ground into a world-class climbing destination and nature preserve. We have spent every weekend for 15 years, and that's been our retirement, and I wouldn't change it for a thing. I would hope that Muir Valley in 10, 20 years is similar to what it is today, that the Friends of Muir Valley are able to keep it going forward and keep it as a place, you know, of wonder. There is a, a climbing community. They're good people, really good people, and willing, you know, to give the shirt off their back, which was very fortunate for us that we saw so much of that in Muir Valley. We had all that. We didn't have to go someplace to, to get it. It was right there for us. And we had so much help from people volunteering, and this wasn't glamorous work, this was dirty work. I look at Rick and I think, we were able to give back to people that meant a lot to us, and I think we've been successful well beyond what we had a right to expect, and it's a good feeling.